We are very glad to welcome you all to this meeting. It's a very important meeting um, with Moshe Machova and Tony Greenstein, organized by the Labour Campaign for Free Speech. We would urge you all to um, sign up to the campaign uh, as members if you can. There's a, a first all members meeting which will take place on May 29th. Uh, to discuss a number of issues so we hope um, you will consider joining us and maybe Esther you could put that in the chat actually the, how to how to join lean uh, labor campaign for free speech that'd be great this meeting um, we've decided to to set up because as comrades know there is a new definition uh, being proposed on anti what anti-semitism is it's called the Jerusalem declaration um, which we believe is worthy of discussion um, the previously most widely used uh, definition of antisemitism is uh, has been produced by the International Holocaust Remem Remembrance Alliance, um, or should we say abused, because it's certainly been uh, used to accuse people of antisemitism when in fact what they've been doing is uh, say anti-Zionist, uh, make anti-Zionist comments. So it's very important to discuss um, the differences between the two definitions. I mean, there are other definitions, of course, but these two are extremely important to the labor movement. Um, the differences between those definitions and also, uh, and I hope the, the speakers will address this and we discuss this in the meeting, is should we campaign for the Jerusalem Declaration if it is better than the IRA to be uh, adopted by the Labour Party, universities and other organizations? We know that the, the threat there's a threat by Gavin Williamson, education secretary, that unless a university signs up to, to IRA, it might be uh, defunded, etc. So should we say, let's have the Jerusalem Declaration instead, um, despite any misgivings we might have, or um, do we need, do we think it's enough to have a, a dictionary definition of what anti-Semitism is? So it's a lot of lot of issues to discuss tonight, and we're very glad to have two very very um, experienced and knowledgeable speakers on this subject. The first one is Moshe, Professor Moshe Machova, um, who was uh, been suspended, I think, twice or expelled. As a, uh, who can keep track of these things? <laughs> many many things. But we're very welcome, uh, very happy to have you tonight here tonight. Hello, Moshe. Thank you very much for inviting me. Actually, to put the record straight, I was expelled once. The expulsion was rescinded, and uh, then much later, I will I have been suspended. I still remain suspended, member of the Labour Party. Okay. Well, thank you for inviting me, uh, and I want to start with a correction. We are not comparing uh, two similar documents. The uh, IHRA so-called definition is not a definition. It pretends to be a definition. Uh, the JDA does not call itself a definition. The, the IHRA definition, so-called, uh, it calls itself a working definition. It isn't. Uh, the other one calls itself uh, the Jerusalem Declaration of anti about anti-Semitism. It contains, among other things, a definition, a real definition. OK, now, I my, my point is, that the uh, former document IHRA is written in bad faith. It is actually uh, uh, written with a purpose to deceive. That is to say bad faith. Um, and I'm going to go through various symptoms of bad faith. I'm not going to say very much uh, about the other document, uh, except it's in sometimes in comparison uh, to uh, in contrast the, to show the contrast, uh, but uh, the, the, my, my general comment about it is that whether you accept the definition contained in it, which is a real definition and it it it, it is not bad, uh, not it has merits, and then whether you you uh, uh, accept the various clauses. Uh, Attached to this document, to this definition, in 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 which they uh, try to uh, explain what would count as anti-Semitism, what manifestations would count as anti-Semitism, what would not count as anti-Semitism, something which the IHRA document never does uh, in in any detail. Uh, 
but uh, I, I'm going to go through various uh, symptoms in the IHRA document to show that it is written in bad faith. The first thing to notice about it is that it is no kind of definition. Anybody with a minimum, I mean, you don't have to be a very educated person. You don't have to be a very experienced person. You don't have to be a very knowledgeable person to see that what is presented there as the def definition, it's the so-called definition is not nothing of the kind. It is really one sentence which says antisemitism is a certain perception of Jews which may be expressed as hatred towards Jews. That is all the definition you get. The other sentence which is included in the same paragraph uh, tells you uh, what uh, uh, form manifestations of antisemitism take. It says rhetorical and physical manifestation of antisemitism are directed towards no Jewish or non-Jewish individuals and or their property towards Jewish community institutions and religious facilities. But this already uh, assumes that you know what antisemitism is. Now, th this is this is derisory as a definition. No, I mean, uh, 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 the main author of this document is Professor Kenneth Stern. He's, he's a professor of whatever it is. And if he thinks that anyone can seriously take this as a definition, then he must be off his rocker or he must be acting in best faith. And I think it is the latter. Antisemitism is certain perception of Jews which may be expressed as hatred towards, what about hostility to Jews? Is this not anti-Semitism? Hostility is not the same as hatred. You may think of some people that you uh, uh, don't necessarily hate, but you feel hostility towards, okay? It's not, not the same kind of thing at all. Does hostility towards Jews not count as anti-Semitism? Okay, so, and this is all the definition you get. The, the, this is only uh, 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 included in document as, as, a, as a hook on which to hang its main part. Now, it has been argued by some people that the uh, so-called examples, the 11 examples that are uh, attached to it are ancillary. They are not part of, the, uh, of, of the, the main document. I beg to differ. They are the actual core of the document. Mm. Uh, the definition is, is rubbish. I mean, nobody can take it, it, it even as, as a, as a draft of a draft of a draft of the, of the definition. It is simply nonsense. But the, the main uh, uh, part of the document is, are the examples, and they are full of, of symptoms of bad faith. Uh, OK. Uh, it is not by chance that when uh, uh, Corbyn, for his uh, sins, uh, agreed to accept the definition part, these two sentences that I, I read. Uh, the uh, anti-Palestinian lobby in Britain attacked him viciously and the, the establishment, that this is not enough. The, what you should adopt are the examples. And from their point of view, they, they were right. The main part of the document are the examples. This is what it was for. The, 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 the uh, 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 rubbish definition is only a sort of a, a, a hook on which to hang the, the, the main uh, uh, poison. Okay, uh, uh, the preamble to the example says manifestations might include the targeting of the state of Israel. Targeting is a loaded word. Targeting is not the same as opposing or attacking. I reserve the, the uh, right to oppose the state of Israel, to oppose its regime, to, to oppose it politically, of course. This is not targeting, it is opposing. If you oppose the, uh, let us say, the conservative government, it doesn't mean that you are targeting it. Target is, is, is a, an emotionally loaded word. It, it is a sign of bad faith. Uh, okay, you are, uh, however, allowed to criticize Israel, criticism of Israel similar to that leveled against any other country. What does that mean? 
Is Israel like, is any country like any other country? Are you allowed to criticize a country only if you are at the same time also criticize similarly, not at the same time only, but similarly at any other country? Why should uh, uh, people who criticize China don't criticize it generally, they criticize it for certain action. These actions are not similar to uh, uh, what they criticize some other country. And this, this is, this is a, a, a loaded and uh, ill-intentioned uh, uh, supposed let out uh, clause. And by the way, uh, we are, uh, according to this document, the, the, the most that we can do is criticize Israel. Why not uh, oppose Israel? In contrast, the uh, other document, the JDA document, is, is much, you know, much more honest. It is, is in fact honest. It says, uh, it speaks about a criticism or hostility to Israel. That, that is to say, it discuss the discusses the possibility of hostility towards Israel, and uh, it tells you, it, in their opinion, what kind of hostility would be uh, uh, would count as anti-Semitism or not count as anti-Semitism. So some forms of hostility to Israel, according to the JDA document, is not uh, uh, does not count as anti-Semitism. It, it's, it allows you to express hostility or to actually uh, enact hostility by opposing Israel politically. That is a gulf of a difference. Uh, another uh, very uh, uh, deep sign, a very profound sign of ill faith, of, of bad faith, is the fact that, as everybody knows, the uh, document is really about uh, criticism, hostility to Zionism. Right, it, uh, in, as you, I, I think it is impossible to deny that the uh, document is designed to um, describe, to denigrate certain uh, uh, forms of anti-Zionism as anti-Semitic. Yet, surprise, surprise, the word Zionism is never mentioned in the document. The uh, good or bad faith of, of, of an utterance is uh, marked not so much by what it does mention, but by what it fails to mention, when it is clearly one of the things it is about. It is not mentioned, but it is implied. And Zionism is actually implicit in the document, in a in a, 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 a rather sly way. By the way, uh, one of the things that convinced me that John Lanzmann was a Zionist Trojan horse in the uh, entourage of uh, uh, Jeremy Corbyn was when he came out with the amazing uh, uh, statement that we should uh, discuss anti-Semitism and uh, 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 Zionism, the state of Israel and opposition to it without mentioning Zionism. This is uh, so absurd as to, uh, somebody would say that you can discuss the, the former Soviet Union without mentioning communism. Zionism is the official ideology of the state of Israel. Several parties call themselves Zionists, so and so. I mean, you can't read a, 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 an Israeli newspaper without on every page encountering the word Zionism. I mean, yet John Lanzmann wanted us to stop using this term. Why? What has it got to hide? Why is it forbidden to, to, well, of course, what is nameless can very only vaguely be discussed. Okay, well, now let's, let's, uh, let's see 
uh, in the document itself how Zionism is embedded in it implicitly without actually mentioning it. I direct you to the seventh uh, uh, example, so-called example of what may be antisemitism. It reads as follows. Denying the Jewish people their right to self-determination, e.g., but claiming that the existence of a state, a state of Israel, as if there, there are several, a existence of a state of Israel is a racist endeavor. Okay. Now, do the Jewish people have a right to self-determination? What does the, the, do, let us say, the Muslim people have a right to self-determination? Is there a, a, a right to establish a Muslim state? Uh, we know that this is not a, a very, why? Why is it, uh, why is it not, why does it sound so fishy? Well, I tell you why. I mean, uh, whether you support or do not support the uh, uh, general principle of right of self-determination, it is the right of self-determination of nations. There is no self, uh, right of self-determination of religions or of people with red hair. The, the, the totality of people with red hair or people with very little hair on their head do not uh, as an international principle, have a right to self-determination in the sense of establishing a, 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 their own you know, political independence or political state. Are the Jews a nation in the sense to which it, it is accepted since after the First World War that nations have a right to self-determination? This is a, a, a generally accepted international principle. Whether you agree with it or not, this is a, another question. But it, it is applicable to nations. Are the totality of Jews a nation? Are they a single nation the world over? This is a contested issue. In fact, many Jewish leaders and individuals, uh, other than the ordinary Jews have, and many other people, have a uh, question whether the, the uh, Jews are a nation, a race, a religion, or whatever. Personally, I think that the Jews, the totality of all Jews in the world are a religion for the simple reason that you can define the totality by its boundary. What is the boundary between Jews and non-Jews? And you define a boundary by what, what form can, does it take to cross the boundary? How does a Jew become a non-Jew? And how does a non-Jew become a Jew? Well, the way to cross this boundary between Jew and non-Jew, between the totality of Jews and totality of non-Jews is by religious conversion. If you are not a Jew, anyone here in this audience who is not a Jew can become a Jew by religious conversion. Anyone here who is a, a Jew by a practice or by a, some kind of background can become a non-Jew by converting to some other religion. That is for me, a, 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 a a clear symptom that the Jews are a, a, a religion rather than a nation. But in any, way, in any case, it is a, a debatable issue. It is not except by Zionists. Zionists claim one of the fundamental tenets of Zionism is that the Jews the world over constitute a single nation. This is a, a, a embedded in the uh, document I'm talking about in the seventh example, implicitly, it, it says that you mustn't deny the Jewish people the right to self-determination as though it is, uh, it is something uh, uh, uncontroversial that they do, uh, the uh, totality of Jews do have the right to self-determination. Why should it be the case? Okay, but this is not the end of it. Uh, e.g. by claiming that the existence of a state of Israel is a racist endeavor. You mustn't, you, but this, this uh, presupposes and implicitly uh, assumes 
that the state of Israel is a, a, an implementation of the so-called right of Jews to self-determination. This too is a Zionist tenet. It is not at all uh, uh, self-understood. It is not at all in controversial. It is in fact a very controversial uh, question because leave aside the question whether the Jews are a, a, a nation and therefore have a right to self-determination. But what does the right of self-determination mean? What does it imply? Does it entitle whoever, whichever group has this right to choose at its own discretion what territory it would self-determine itself in, uh, what form this would take, whether uh, it, it includes the right to colonize a territory inhabited by other people? Certainly not. The right of self-determination entitles a, a, a group of people that are a nation to a, a not live under foreign rule if, if they choose not to. In a, a territory where they are already a majority, it doesn't entitle a group of people to colonize some other territory where uh, other people live. That is not included in self-determination. As uh, normally understood, Self-determination of a group that is entitled to this is the right not in territories where it is a majority of the population not to live under an imposed foreign rule. That's all. But certainly Israel has not been established. A state of Israel, any state of Israel has not been established according to this. So whether or not you accept uh, other, the other parts of this definition, this clause, example seven, uh, implicitly assumes Zionism without calling it, without actually uh, uh, admitting that this is a very controversial, or a, in fact, two, in, it, in, it implicitly assumes two very controversial tenets of uh, Zionist ideology. So it is, the, uh, this is part of the construction of a trap that is uh, designed to entrap people who are not Zionists and define them as uh, anti-Semitic. Uh, another sign of bad faith is the next clause, applying double standards by requiring of it a behavior not expected or demanded of any other democratic nation. Now, what does it refer to? It refers to the it here, the, the uh, pronoun it refers to something in the previous clause. Uh, the, the, there are in fact two nouns to which it might uh, uh, refer. The Jewish people or the state of Israel. Well, I, it, it certainly doesn't refer to the Jewish people. You can't, you can't uh, say that uh, the Jewish people is analogous to any other democratic, or maybe, the other, are the Jewish people a democratic nation? This is, this, are they a nation at all, let alone a democratic nation? Uh, hardly. What about the state of Israel? Uh, it says, uh, it, it would be double standard to acquire, to, to require it, just possibly the state of Israel, to uh, 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 double, uh, to, uh, to uh, require of its standards not expected or demanded of any other democratic nation. Well, the state of Israel is not a nation, it is an institution. There, there are two nations actually in the state of Israel, the, the a colonizing a settler nation, uh, uh, which is a, a consequence of Zionist colonization and the Palestinian Arab uh, uh, national group. But uh, uh, this is not a reference to this, it is a reference to the state of Israel. Is Israel a democratic state? Again, uh, this has been contested no least by the uh, prime, human rights organization in Israel, Bezalem. They say, no, Israel is not a democratic nation, not a democratic state. It cannot be a democratic state. It controls 
a territory in which half the population has no rights, is not no citizens' rights. So implicitly, the uh, H example presupposes that something that that uh, uh, is contestable. This is a sign of uh, bad faith. You don't make explicit what you are assuming. You actually automatically presuppose it. The next, <laughs> the next example is is uh, even more interesting. It it is anti-Semitic according to this definition. This is clause nine or example nine. Drawing comparisons of contemporary Israeli policy to that of the Nazis. Now, let, let, let me mention by, by, by comparison that uh, the uh, J, JDA document doesn't mention Nazism at all. Why, what, 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 why is Nazism uh, in the context of Israel? Why, why is this mentioned? Okay, now let's, let's look carefully at uh, this uh, clause. It says, drawing comparison of contemporary Israeli policy to that of the Nazis. Now, leaving aside the fact that many Israeli scholars, some of whom are experts on uh, the whole uh, issue of genocide and, and, and the Holocaust in particular have actually compared some Israeli uh, policies to uh, those uh, of the Nazis. I don't make this comparison. I, I, I think it is the wrong kind of comparison. The, the, the comparison should be more like the comparison between other colonizing projects. The comparison should be like the comparison, let us say, comparing uh, the Zionist colonization to that of Australia or New Zealand. Now, I would say that the, the, this comparison is instructive. Zionist colonization has not been as bad as in Tasmania, for example. I, I think we can, we can fairly say this. On the other hand, it has not been as good or, or as less bad as that is New Zealand. These are meaningful con, uh, uh, comparisons. But some people make comparisons between Israeli policies and the Nazis. Why should this be anti-Semitic? It may be right, it may be wrong, it may be over the top, it may not be over the top, but what is anti-Semitic about? Why should, why should uh, comparisons of Israeli policies with Nazis be anti-Semitic? Well, I brought my brain to uh, uh, understand why the only reason, the only reason why it should be not merely wrong, maybe a, a, a over the top as far as Israel is concerned, maybe, maybe unjust towards Israel, maybe at the limit, but why should it be anti-Semitic? Well, the only way in which it could be anti-Semitic is uh, if you, uh, assume that Israel is acting in the name and on behalf of all Jews. If Israel is actually a, the, the, the representative of all Jewish people and you compare uh, what it does to Nazism, then this is insulting to Jews. But look, the next example says that it is anti-Semitic. What is anti-Semitic is holding Jews collectively responsible for actions of the state of Israel. This is a and this is one of the examples with which I do agree. It is actually correct to say that it is anti-Semitic to hold Jews collectively responsible for the actions of the state of Israel. Israel claims, Israel claims to be acting uh, uh, on behalf of all Jews, but I think it is actually anti-Semitic to hold Jews responsible for it. But this, this uh, uh, says that the document, the IHRA document condemns itself as anti-Semitic. It, 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 it contains this logical paralogism that 
uh, amounts to self-condemnation as anti-Semitic. Okay? Five more minutes, Moshe. So, uh, uh, I, I would end with the remark that the, the main author of this document, uh, Kenneth Stern, claimed in, in, in his testimony before Congress actually says this document is not meant as a legal document, correct, it is worthless. Uh, 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 barristers, uh, several barristers have looked at it and said, you know, this is, this is not usable as a, as a legal document. And by the way, we know that the Labour Party, having accepted this document under Corbyn, did not use it as, as a, 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 a procedural document for for dealing with anti-Semitism, which is useless uh, juridically. If it came before a, 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 a proper court in this country or uh, presumably in the United States, it, it, it would fail as, as a, a, a criterion for a hate speech. There are, there are laws against hate speech, but this, this is worthless. He said that it was meant uh, in order to collect uh, statistics about anti-Semitism, if I remember correctly, this is this was his, the, the purpose was not to prevent debate in universities, which it is used for, uh, but uh, to uh, uh, collect information, to let, collect statistics originally in the European Union as what would what would count as anti-Semitism anti in the uh, European Union. Well. If, even in that case, it is a sign of bad faith because it would uh, result in false statistics. Okay, uh, all I have to say, uh, in addition to the, the uh, correct concerning the JDA, is that it doesn't have these faults. It is obvious, it is not ideal, and I, I wouldn't recommend its adoption as a sort of uh, uh, touchstone as, a, as a, an ultimate definition. Uh, I think uh, th there are enough laws uh, against uh, racial uh, incitement in this country. Uh, it is a, a document worth studying and, and uh, using in a, in a reasonable way, not, as a, not as, a, as a club or a bludgeon. But at least, you know, it is a, a document composed in obvious good faith. It, it uh, uh, obviously tries to do what it sets out to do. The people uh, who have uh, uh, composed it uh, are uh, knowledgeable and expert people in their own field. They are, nobody is perfect and this document is not perfect, but it shines in, in comparison to the IHRA def the, uh, uh, so-called definition because that is uh, uh, full of bad faith and the JDA is a, a, a reasonable document composed in good faith. Thank you very much. That's all I have to say at this stage. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Moshe. That was excellent, just as we expected uh, from you. So you've made really good points against the IRA misdefinition of anti-Semitism, as we, we call it. And we have a, have a little bit of a division of labor. And Tony is going to look at the... Um, uh, Jerusalem Declaration in a bit more detail, but it's a, it's it's an interesting point you make. It's perhaps if if your university or your Labour Party CLP, you know, is being forced to uh, adopt or it's on the agenda to adopt the IRA, you could use the Jerusalem to say this is actually better. Um, but you know, campaigning for it, I, I think I would have difficulties with that as well. It's better, but it is not without problems. And I hope comrades uh, study it. We've put the links into the chat a few times, so it's worthwhile studying it. Um, and it, Moshe makes a very good point. It's been written in, in good faith. It's not without uh, problem act problems and mistakes, perhaps, you know, um, over egging the pudding a couple of times, but it's definitely better. Thank you, Tony, for joining us. You're a 30 Thank minute you, comrade. Uh, well, it's a hard act to follow. Uh, I mean, that was a brilliant exposition of everything that's wrong with the IHRA. Unfortunately, I've also, uh, I mean, I was left scratching my head thinking what else can be said about the IHRA when I was trying to work out what to say that hasn't already been said. Uh, and I think the first thing, firstly, I've got just one thing to pick up with with Moshe when he says, well, 
a Jew can convert, uh, a non-Jew can convert to a Jew. Would that Tony, be... could you could you look into the camera a bit more? Sorry. You have half yeah. of the... Yeah, uh, fortunately, it's the nature of my camera. You will have to bear with me. Uh, when Moshe said that, of course, uh, a non-Jew can convert to a Jew, which is true, with one exception, that in Israel, the conversion authority explicitly rules out on ethnic grounds, the conversion of Palestinians to become Jews, which just shows that being Jewish in Israel is a racial hierarchy. It's not a religious hierarchy. Uh, and, and just one other brief comment on the comparison uh, with the Nazis, which is, of course, is one of the prohibitions of the IHRA. Uh, I just want to reinforce that some of the people in Israel who have made these comparisons are themselves Holocaust survivors. And uh, I refer to, in particular, the late Professor Zev Sternholm, who was a child survivor of a, a Nazi ghetto in Poland. He came out in uh, Haaretz explicitly with that comparison, as did Yehuda Alkana, who was a survivor of Auschwitz, uh, a, ch a child survivor of Auschwitz. Again, in his uh, famous essay in Haaretz, uh, The Need to Forget, he made, again, just such a comparison. But one of the things about the IHRA, which uh, has most puzzled me, is that it's such a flimsy, loose, imprecise document. And yet it's gained such uh, a momentum. Uh, and it really reminds me of the saying of uh, Marx in the German ideology, and I quote, the ideas of the ruling class are in every epoch the ruling ideas. That is the class which is the ruling material force of society is at the same time its ruling intellectual force. And I think that's particularly true of the IHRA. If it wasn't for the key position it occupies as a kind of propaganda weapon in the armory of our rulers, it would have sunk without a trace. It's, it has been subject to a really massive uh, amount of criticism, both quantitative and qualitative. I, I can't think of any legal scholar of any r repute who, who hasn't savaged it. Uh, Sir Stephen Sedley, who was a former Court of Appeal judge and is himself Jewish, Hugh Tomlinson, uh, Jeffrey Robinson, QC, who said it was unfit for purpose, uh, Sir Jeffrey Bynman, and so on. So what is it that makes the IHRA attractive? It clearly, I, in my opinion, is the utility that the IHRA has. And Moshe mentioned uh, in particular, and I'm gonna come on to this if I can find it. Uh, he mentioned the, the definition, the so-called definition, the 38 word definition of the IHRA. Uh, that anti-Semitism is a form of hate which may be ex or may be expressed as hate. Uh, and th there is, there's been a debate uh, of sorts uh, about the Jewish, uh, the Jerusalem Declaration on Anti-Semitism. And one of the main articles is by Carrie Nelson. And it's in Fathom, which is the Zionist premier. Uh, can I share my screen, Tina, by any chance? so I can show people. Let me just check. Um, okay, try. yep, go on. Mm -hmm. Right, okay. Uh, tell me if you can pick it up. Not yet. No, oh. that's yeah. starting. Yep. Yeah, okay, this is the article. It's in Fathom, which is produced <laughs> by Bicom. Uh, and the article is by someone called Carrie Nelson, who's a, a senior American academic. And it's, it says, accommodating that the uh, Jerusalem Declaration is nothing more than accommodating the new anti Semitism. And he goes on to say, uh, and I'm not sure how I scroll down on this. Sorry. Yes, I can do that, can't I? He goes on to say, regarding the 38 word definition, if you remember, as I say, the 38 word definition uh, 
which is anti-Semitism is a certain perception uh, of Jews, which may be expressed as hatred towards Jews. And I'm trying to go between different, uh, different windows. So please uh, excuse me. Uh, Father, Father must two to the right. Is it right? Unfortunately, I can't see it. Uh, it's it's just my screen. Two windows to the right. Yes, I, I'm, for some reason it has stopped video and various other things on it. Yeah, that, that's okay. okay. In his article, Four Fathom, uh, Carrie Nelson is quite clear. He says, if opponents bothered to engage actual definition inspired practices, they might recognize the fact that the brief opening preamble definition, that is the 38 word so-called definition, much criticized as being vague and unusable, is not in fact being used. It is not really meant to be used. It provides a general cultural context for what follows. Uh, I, I think that's correct. Uh, he's being honest about it. It was never meant to be used. It, it is in fact unusable precisely because it's not a definition. And, and if we relate that to what happened at the end of 2016, Jeremy Corbyn, of his own volition, adopted the IHRA definition, the 38 words definition, which of course was meaningless. But what it did allow, it, it acted as a kind of Trojan horse because it enabled then his opponents to press for the adoption of the whole definition, which of course, is what happened. But the, the, the defense, uh, it, it is quite interesting. Uh, I think we can end uh, sharing for the time being. I'll stop sharing now so you, you can see me. The defense of the IHRA against the Jerusalem Declaration on Antisemitism has been conducted by a number of Zionist academics, one of whom is uh, Dave Rich. He is the deputy director of the Community Security Trust, about which I wish to say it has been one of the main organizations propagating the IHRA. The, the, the Community Security Trust, for your information, collects statistics or manipulates statistics on anti Semitism as part of the overall propaganda offensive. What Dave Rich wrote, and it was an article in the Jewish Chronicle, uh, and my plea to the left, treat the Jews the same as you'd treat any other minority. It was also reprinted uh, in Al Gamena, uh, an American Zionist uh, publication under a slightly different title. We don't need another definition of Jew hate. And what he said in his article was quite amazing. He said, on the left, but, uh, he said, the Hungarian government's campaign, he, he gave this as an example of why the IHRA was necessary and why the Jerusalem Declaration on Antisemitism was redundant. And he said, the Hungarian government's campaign against George Soros never mentions the fact that Soros is Jewish. Well, I think most people understand that. It would be very difficult not to understand it. It doesn't attack him, quote, as a Jew but it derives its resonance and force from the use of undeniably anti-Semitic language. And that, that's quite correct. I mean, uh, George Soros won an election. It was in January, 2018, with a specific campaign against George Soros as the archetypal Jewish financier. There's no doubt uh, that it was anti-Semitic. Uh, Viktor Orban, the prime minister of Hungary is also the best pals of uh, Benjamin Netanyahu and is admired widely uh, by Zionists. But the point I'm making is that Viktor Orban is a strong supporter of the IHRA. The IHRA uh, was able to say and do absolutely nothing. On the contrary, there is nothing about the IHRA that anti-Semites don't like. Uh, it's perfectly compatible with you being an anti-Semite. The Polish government likewise has supported the IHRA. Donald Trump issued an executive order implementing and enforcing the IHRA on campuses 
something called Title VI. In other words, federal funding depended on adherence to the IHRA. So that is one of the point, the major points about the IHRA. If you are a genuine anti-Semite, you should really have very few problems with it. It's precisely aimed, of course, at anti-Zionists, and therein lies the problems with it. I mean, I, I called Dave Rich, uh, who is the deputy director of uh, the CAST, uh, a police state academic or an academic prostitute. He simply hires himself out to who, whoever uh, will hire him. Uh, there is no independent judgment. There is no academic integrity. Whereas many academics, include, I mean, Zionist academics, Jeffrey Alderman, for example, who's a right-wing Zionist, nonetheless is extremely critical of the IHRA. Another one is David Fellman, who was of the Peers Institute of Antisemitism at Birkbeck, except that the Peers uh, Foundation, uh, which is a, a Jewish foundation, has now distanced itself from his criticism and because he signed the Jerusalem Declaration. So there is an internal war, but Fellman uh, said of uh, the IHRA, it's bewilderingly imprecise. But I want to give some context to what's happening. And again, I, I really need to share my screen if that's possible. Uh, and maybe, sorry. Uh, you should be still able to do it. Should I? Okay, fine. Then I shall. Uh, Okay, right. Uh, let me try it. Sorry, comrades. Share screen. Right. Can everyone see the screen? Yep. Right. This is a book. It was a book issued, and it's well worth getting, called On Antisemitism, issued by the American group Jewish Voice for Peace. Uh, you can see it, and there's a forward by Judith Butler. And there's an extremely interesting article in it, which really has received very little attention by Anthony Lerman, who is one of the main scholars and experts on anti-Semitism. His background is he founded the Institute for Jewish Policy Research, but because he didn't accept the nostrum that anti-Zionism equals anti-Semitism, he was forced out of it, uh, quite simply. Uh, people like Stanley Carnes, who was the treasurer of the Conservative Party, couldn't tolerate him. And what he wrote is extremely interesting. Uh, I, I want to quote it. It's on the left-hand side. Image. Can, you, can everyone see that? He said, I had close personal experience of the role the Mossad played in establishing Israeli hegemony over the monitoring and combating of anti-Semitism. And I'll stop there. Mossad is Israel's equivalent of MI6. Can you imagine that if we were to collate statistics of racial incidents, racism, and so on in Britain, that the organization to do that would be MI6? You, you would scratch your head in wonderment. Why would MI6 or MI5 do so? The reason I think is obvious. It is because anti Semitism forms part of the main propaganda and ideological offensive of the Israeli state. That is why it is so important. And he goes on to say, while I was director of the Institute of Jewish Affairs and its successor, the Institute for Jewish Policy Research in the 1990s, I founded and was principal editor of the annual Antisemitism World Report, the first objective, independent, country by country survey of antisemitism worldwide. The London Mossad representative dealing with antisemitism made it clear that they were unhappy about our independent operation and then tried to pressurize us, pressure us into either ceasing publication or merging our report with one that the then new project for the study of antisemitism at Tel Aviv University, headed by Professor Dina Parat, who is now the chief historian at Yad Vashem, which is the Israeli Holocaust Museum and part financed by the Mossad, was beginning to produce. I vigorously resisted the pressure, as I recalled in my book, The Making and Unmaking of a Zionist, quote, I tried to persuade the Israelis to allow us to operate without interference, but was given short shrift by the Mossad representative of the Israeli embassy in London and by the Israeli ambassador himself, with whom I had met, together with the chairman of the IJA to discuss the matter in 1994. Notwithstanding, we continued to produce our reports 
and continued to come under pressure from Mossad. A year or two later, I made a further effort to persuade them to end their attempts to undermine our work, which they were having su success in doing, as certain Jewish anti-Semitism monitoring bodies in other countries succumbed to Mossad demands that they cease to provide us with the information about developments in their countries. Uh, and I, I will stop there uh, and try and get back. I can. Right, okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, comrade. Yep. Okay. No, hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh, oh, sorry, I thought you finished. <laughs> I have not finished, no, I'm afraid not. Was the point I'm making is that the collation of anti Semitism statistics, the whole anti Semitism campaign, of which the CST is an integral part, is also part of the Israeli government's offensive that there are no neutral collection of statistics on anti Semitism. It is a political weapon in the hands of the Zionist movement. I want to make a few other comments. Uh, the underlying assumption behind the IHRA is that criticism of Israel is anti-Semitic unless it has proved otherwise. For example, uh, the uh, illustration of anti-Semitism that uh, criticism of Israel, which is double standards, is anti-Semitic. Uh, I mean, it's quite amazing. Uh, People may have all sorts of reasons for criticizing Israel and no other country. For example, they're Palestinians and their homes just been demolished. Why is it anti-Semitic for them only to criticize Israel? I mean, it, it simply makes no sense whatsoever. And there is another, and again, I, I want to share uh, the screen if I can, uh, Tina. Still working. It's still working. Okay, fine. I've just got to find out where. Uh, is it? I may not be able to do that this time. Uh, another, well, another. Can people see my screen now? Nope. Not yet. Not yet. Okay, hold on. Share screen. Another example. Right, can you see it now? Yeah. 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 Another example, of course, is the claim that if you allege that Jews have a dual loyalty, both to Israel and to the country they live in, that is anti Semitic. Uh, well, I, I guess it is. Yes, it is anti Semitic, although it's also true. Many Jews de declare it. But the whole point of Zionism is that in, it insists that Jews have a dual loyalty. In fact, they insist that Jews main principal loyalty is to the Israeli state. I mean, uh, uh, I've been called many things, Jewish self-hater, capo, etc. But one of the choice insults is that I'm a traitor, to which I ask, well, who am I a traitor to? And the answer is uh, Zionism and Israel. And it's quite interesting, the free Jewish spy, American Jewish spy in America, he served 30 years, but he's now come to Israel recently, Jonathan Pollard, came out with it and said, Jews will always have dual loyalty, whether they know it or not. Uh, it's in the blood, as it were. And if you look down, uh, there is another. Uh, a few years ago, there was a, a survey by the Israeli Foreign Ministry and the Ministry of Absorption, which was distributed to thousands of American Jews. And the survey said, uh, where do you, if there was a crisis in relationship between America and Israel, where do your loyalties lie? Well, this caused a major controversy, of course. Uh, people were extremely unhappy about such a survey being distributed, and Netanyahu called an end to it. But well, this is what you tell her, yes. girls. This is what, uh, if you like, lies behind the hypocrisy. Yes, I mean, accusing Jewish people of dual loyalty is anti Semitic. But who is it who insists on that dual loyalty? The very organization and the very movement, which then says it's anti Semitic. So, once again, they try to have their cake and to eat it. I, I did want to have a look at, and I'm not sure whether I'm going to be able to get hold of it here. Uh, I may come back on it uh, later. It is. 
it is a, a document that was, and I, I'll actually here it is, I think. Uh, right. Uh, there is a very, very interesting document on the genesis of the of the working definition of anti-Semitism. Can everybody see it? Yes. This was a conference held, it was in Paris, but it was under the auspices of Tel Aviv University, the working definition of anti-Semitism six years after. And it was held in 2010, I say, in Paris. And the, the key lecture that was given was by Kenneth Stern, the working definition a reappraisal. And I'm going to bring it up here. That is this document here, the working definition of anti-Semitism, a reappraisal. And he was explaining the problems he'd had with the European Union Monitoring Committee, which had constructed its own definition of anti-Semitism and then was persuaded to adopt uh, the, the uh, IHRA, or what became the IHRA, but it was uh, the working definition of anti-Semitism that Kenneth Stern and others had been working on. And he said, I had the strong sense it constructed this clunker of a definition because it didn't know how to deal with the problem of a Jew being attacked in the streets of Paris or anywhere else as a stand-in for an Israeli. I mean, this in itself is dishonest because if you attack a, a, someone who's Jewish because they're Jewish, it doesn't really matter what the reason is, it's anti-Semitic. And that's quite clearly covered by, for example, the Oxford English Dictionary definition. He was complaining that listing stereotypes as the engine and defining characteristics of anti-Semitism led the EUMC, the European Union Monitoring Committee, to the conclusion that factors saw Israel through stereotypical lenses and then attacked the Jew in front of them as a substitute, that was anti-Semitism. But if the actor was rather animated by dislike of Israeli policies or actions, then that same attack uh, was not anti-Semitism. They said, it is unworkable to form a clear view of what is in the mind of any actor, many of whom are never found. Uh, again, uh, a completely bogus issue, but as a matter of fact, it's absolutely crucial to establish the question of motive as to whether an attack is anti-Semitic. Imagine if I go into the streets and I'm mugged uh, for what I'm carrying, uh, but it's a random an attack which would have happened on anyone. That is not an anti-Semitic attack. However, if someone shouts dirty Jew or targets my home because they know being Jewish, I will be rich, then that is anti-Semitic. But you certainly do have to establish motive. And the IHRA is based on the idea that motive is irrelevant. Uh, and this is another reason why I think the definition simply doesn't stand up. The Jerusalem Declaration, uh, I'll just make a very short uh, point because I know time is getting on. The Jerusalem Declaration has many imperfections. Uh, for instance, it says that classic tropes, anti-Semitic stereotypes, images and so on, uh, or classic feudal anti-Semitism is still anti-Semitic. I think the key mistake it makes, and the key mistake that the IHRA makes, but it, for the IHRA, it's not a mistake, is to substitute Israel for a Jew. The new anti-Semitism. Uh, literally, Israel was the new Jew on the block, in the words of Erwin Kotler. Uh, the reason why Israel was attacked was not because of what it did, but because it was a Jewish state. Uh, and this is a misnomer. Now, let me give you a practical example. There was, in the Middle Ages, a few, uh, in the Middle Ages, one of the tropes was that Jews poisoned uh, the wells of non-Jews, their water sources, and that was clearly anti-Semitic. But today, it, it's a, it's an undisputable fact that Israel has poisoned the water sources of Palestinians. It did it in 1948 when it introduced typhoid into the water source for Acre. It's without doubt the settlers attacked the water sources of Palestinians, throwing cars into them, rubbish, garbage, you name it. So is it anti-Semitic to say what Israel does? Because in the past, Jews were falsely accused of this. No, of course not. But what the IHRA does is introduce a completely new 
conception of anti-Semitism. Historically, anti-Semitism was based on fables, myths, and lies. The IHRA says that something can be true, and yet it can still be anti-Semitic. And that is the result of the nonsense way that Zionism has tried to use anti-Semitism as a shield to protect it. I've probably gone on far too long now, so I thank you for your patience, uh, and I will leave it at that and take any new questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, comrade. Um, Pamela, I think you've got a question. Would you like to come in? Well, I'm looking for Pamela. Asked to unmute. Right, th thanks very much. Okay, great talks, thank you. Um, two questions, first of all. Uh, one is that, uh, can you still hear me? My yes, yeah. yes, yes. Um, one issue which I think helps explain the undemocratic nature of Israel is the issue of the passport. My understanding is that citizenship is given to all is Israeli citizens, which I believe is in within the green line, uh, but nationality is not Israeli. That, so that does that mean on a, an Israeli passport, your nationality is not Israeli, but it's Jewish or Arab or whatever else, which is of course a great advantage to Israel, because if all the citizens were Israeli, um, they would have to give them all equal rights. Um, and the second question is about uh, so-called left anti-Semitism, which um, my understanding is that David Feldman of the P Peers Institute um, agrees with, or his department, some of his department does. And I think this is something that's really important to rebut um, because uh, you know, if you're active in the Labour Party, you, you come across the AWL uh, who use this um, all the time to attack um, um, anti-Zionists like ourselves. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Would, any, would anybody else like to speak or make a contribution? Please, can you click raise hand? Okay, there's Steve Freeman. Can you um, uh, switch on your camera, please, comrade? It's more of a way of a question, really, because not so much about the IR. Can you hear me all right? Not so much about the IRHA, but about the Jerusalem declaration, which I'd never heard of, I have to say, until a couple of days ago when I saw this. But I've had a quick look at it, a look at it, and it seems to be, I think, kind of supportive or something that we might be something that could be used. And I'm not really sure about that because you've got to look at it almost word by word to, 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 to analyze it. And I, I haven't say I've done that yet, but to me, this might be something that's useful. So I would like to know from both of the speakers, you know, it could be that it's like 90% okay and there's a bit of a problem with it, or it could be 100% rubbish or, you know what I mean? So obviously it's got a lot of material in there and you, a, de a definition can be short, but in the context of dealing with the IRHA definition, it does take on the examples by trying to give its counter examples. So I tend to look at this slightly sympathetically and wonder if it might be something we could use, but I would like to hear what Tony and Moshe had to say about it. They both touched upon it, but not really got into it. Now, it could just be that I, you comrades have looked at it a lot, but I, I say I'm quite ignorant of it. So most of us, I don't know how many people on this call have, have read or know about it. So it just could be my ignorance, but um, I, I'm quite interested to hear your view on that. That's it. Thank you, Steve. Um, there is a question that's just come in via email and I put it in the chat. And perhaps Moshe and Tony could look at that. Um, Regarding the JDA's item A3, an example of anti-Semitic deeds includes daubing swastikas on Jewish graves. I'm wondering, can it then be fairly said that someone who paints a swastika on the tombstone, tombstone of um, Goldstein or Ariel Sharon to suggest that their stances or actions bear comparisons to those of Nazis is necessarily anti-Semitic? Um, okay, I've got no other questions at the moment or contributions. So perhaps both speakers could get back um, to, to discuss what we're supposed to be doing about the Jerusalem Declaration. Should we advocate it 
or not. I mean, Moshe has touched on it, um, saying, you know, it's it's enough to have a definition in the in the dictionary, etc. You don't need, necessarily need one. But could it be advisable sometimes to use it, or is it best to say, let's not? There's too many problems with it. Okay. Um, I would suggest then that we bring uh, Moshe first back in ten minutes or so, if you. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I would like first of all to uh, address the question of uh, Pamela. Uh, <clears throat> this is a very uh, a complex and confusing issue. The uh, Israeli identity card, until nine, until two thousand and five, contained. A, a, a rubric which said Leom, which means nation, national identity, or uh, which nation you belong to. Leom means nation in, in Hebrew. Um, and it, it contained the, the, the usual uh, confusion that uh, um, Zionism has uh, uh, introduced. Zionism, in my view, this uh, invented, in other words, uh, uh, obliterated one nation and invented two others. The two nations that it invented is the Jewish nation about which I spoke. I mean, the Zionist idea that all Jews around the world constitute the nation. Another, which may be unknown to you, is the Druze nation. Now, the Druze is, in fact, a religious sect uh, uh, of uh, Arabs. Uh, it exists in, I mean, it, the majority are in Lebanon and Syria, but there are some in Israel as well. They are Arabs to all intents and purposes of a, a, a heretical sect that split from the Shia, which, it spreads, which itself is a split from Sunni Islam. Anyway, uh, Israel uh, uh, wanted, the, the, the Druze were a minority that was used by various regimes as a sort of Cossacks against the rest of the population. Israel uh, uh, took them over and wanted to mobilize them to use them in the Israeli army, which it didn't want to use Muslims and Christians for. So it redefined the Druze as a, as a, a, a nation, which is nonsense, it's pure, pure fiction. On the other hand, the real nation that came into existence uh, as a result of Zionist colonization, which is uh, the Hebrews, mainly Hebrew speaking uh, a new nation that was mentioned in the Israeli Declaration of Independence has been obliterated by Zionism for religious, for uh, ideological purposes into which I cannot go into. Okay, now to, to answer the question directly, at the moment, the uh, Israeli ID document, the internal ID document, which every Israeli citizen has to carry, does not mention uh, uh, ethnic or national affiliation. It, it, it mentions uh, citizenship. And all Israeli citizens are uh, uh, registered in this document as uh, Israeli, if they are uh, Israeli citizens. If they are residents only, then it's mentioned that they are residents, they are not, not citizens. Okay. However, in the Israeli passport, uh, the, there is a complication. The uh, rubric that you read in English and French, nationality or nationalité, uh, mentions Israeli. This is because according to an international uh, convention, uh, promulgated after the First World War when French was the uh, diplomat main diplomatic language, the uh, uh, rubrics in the passport uh, that mention cities that, that define citizenship use the French word for citizenship. Confusingly, the French word for citizenship is nationalité, which doesn't refer to nation. That is to say the nationalité of a Scottish person is, is British for the time being, not Scottish. Although the Scottish person belongs to the Scottish nation, uh, his or her nationality is British. And this applies to the Israeli passport as well. So under the rubric nationality, all Israeli uh, citizens' passports are marked Israeli. However, in the Hebrew translation, 
the translation is not Leom, which is nation, national uh, group to which you belong, but Ezrahut, which means citizenship, because uh, it, it conforms to the international convention. So uh, apparently, the, uh, if you look at the passport, it seems deceptively that all Israeli citizens have Israeli nationality, which does not correspond to Israeli law, but it corresponds to the international convention of passports. I think I've made this complexity a little bit clearer. It is a little bit complicated, but that's what it is. It is, it is, uh, 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 and by the way, in your uh, British passport, if you look at it, the, the uh, rubric, if you are a British citizen, then it says nationality, nationalité, British citizen. Okay, <laughs> that's, that's because nationalité in passports means citizenship, not something else. Okay, I, I forgot, what was, what, what was the second question? About um, oh, yeah, about left anti-Semitism and uh, David Feldman, which is always being thrown at us. I I I, I think by definition, uh, left anti-Semitism doesn't exist because yeah. because anyone who is anti-Semitic doesn't count as in in my book as a leftist. Uh, there are pretend leftists, uh, and I come across several people who present themselves as leftists and who are contaminated with anti-Semitism. There are all sorts, I mean, in, in this world of ours, there are all sorts of, of uh, strange beasts. And you find, I've come across one or two, not, not very many people who uh, regard themselves as leftists and who subscribe to most of the, you know, uh, ideas of the left, except that they are, they are anti-Semitic. I mean, uh, uh, you, you, I'm sure you come across all sorts of, strange combination. As for the last question about uh, uh, painting a swastika on uh, the grave of uh, Baruch uh, Goldstein or somebody like this, I think this is a very good question. And I, I, I would say uh, uh, it, it is, it is uh, uh, not uh, necessarily anti-Semitic. I think it may be a bad, a, a bad use uh, of of the symbol, but uh, 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 the, uh, uh, judging by the uh, motivation behind it, I wouldn't call it anti-Semitic. And the, as far as the question posed by Tina is concerned, I would recommend not using the uh, JDA definition. I wouldn't say, you know, you uh, uh, University of, of uh, uh, Northeast London, uh, you should, uh, instead of using the IHRA definition, use the JDA uh, uh, document. I wouldn't, I wouldn't put it like this. I would say it would be useful if you consult it. It is, it is uh, 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 instructive to consult it. Don't take anything, you know, as, as uh, scripture, uh, neither this nor the other, but it contains some interesting ideas which should not be ignored. Uh, that's, that's all I have to say about it. Very good point, Moshe. Thank you very much. Don't take anything as scripture. I think we can all agree on that. Tony, um, would you be able, in your summing up, to, um, we had a couple of comments in the chat, if you could speak about the Jerusalem Declaration a bit more, what's good about it and perhaps what's okay. not so good about it? Yeah, I will do that. Let me just get that on my screen. I won't ask you to share it. Uh, Firstly, I mean, I think that given we are in a situation where the IHRA has been foisted upon people and hundreds of councils have adopted it, including major political parties, the police, and so on and so forth, that where you have an alternative, such as the Jerusalem Declaration, we should positively argue that organisations should adopt it in preference to the IHRA for one very simple reason. The Jewish de the Jerusalem Declaration on Antisemitism is actually about antisemitism. We may not agree with it all. Uh, yeah. We may not agree with where we are, but it is about antisemitism. The IHRA is not about antisemitism. And therefore, it's a complete hoax and a trick, a confidence trick, to actually suggest and imply that somehow it's about protecting Jews. So I am much more positive about it. Uh, and the reasons of this, really, and I 
firstly, it has a very clear definition. Anti-Semitism is discrimination, prejudice, hostility or violence against Jews as Jewish or Jewish institutions as Jewish, which is in essence the Oxford English Dictionary definition. I think that's fine. You can argue about it, but, uh, but they, they are semantic points. I, I don't agree with everything that it says, in particular point three, anti-Semitism can be manifested in words, visual images, etc. But I think it's pretty okay. It's divided into three sections. That's there's a general section A, B, Israel and Palestine, examples that on the face of it are anti Semitic. Uh, I, I have problems with some of them, but not major problems with them. And C, it, the final section, Israel and Palestine, examples that on the face of it are not anti Semitic, whether or not one approves or not. And it says, supporting the Palestinian demand for justice. I mean, Palestinians aren't mentioned in the IHRA. Uh, uh, they say that's not anti-Semitic. Criticizing opposing Zionism as former nationalism, et cetera, or arguing for different constitutional arrangements, including one state between the Jordan and the Mediterranean. That's very good. Evidence-based criticism of Israel as a state is not anti-Semitic. BDS is not anti-Semitic. Political speech does not have to be measured, proportional, tempered, or reasonable. Again, I, I think that's positive. So on balance, although it's not everything I would want, given the range of people who drew it up, both Zionists and anti-Zionists, if you like the honest Zionists, not the crooks like David Rich, then I, I really do think it's, it is an acceptable definition. Of course, if I was in a different place entirely, I would say, why do you need a definition of anti-Semitism? I mean, the examples I use is my dad, he went to, he fought in the Battle of Cable Street in 36 against Oswald Mosley's British Union of Fascists. Did he need a definition of anti-Semitism before he went to confront the fascists? Of course not. It's an absurdity. It's a, it, it's a talking point which has been foisted by Zionism upon us. But we are where we are. We're not where we would like to be. And in that sense, I would much prefer it to the IHRA, which has nothing positive about it. To deal with the other points uh, briefly, the question of the passport. I mean, uh, Moshe and I have discussed and debated this before. I think Israel is basically lying through its teeth when it says on its passport that uh, its nationality is Israeli. It's not true. There have been two major Israeli court cases, George Tamarin in 1970 and Uzi Ornan, both versus the State of Israel in 2013, which have said specifically that there is no Israeli nationality, because in the words, I think, of the presiding judge Agronar, this would divide the Jewish people between Israel and the rest of the Jews. And the whole basis of Zionism is there is one solid unified Jewish people, which is why an Israeli nationality is simply not acceptable. Uh, so uh, Moshe and I do have uh, some differences on that, but uh, I mean, they're not, they're not massive. As regards to left anti-Semitism, I agree, there is no phenomena of left anti-Semitism. There was for a time in the 19th century when Jews themselves were changing from their role as money lenders, speculators and whatever, into workers, uh, very marginal workers at that. There were groups, in particular anarchist groups led by Proudhon, uh, who believed that the Jew was the archetypal uh, image of a capitalist and therefore anti-capitalism became anti-Semitic. Those days have long since gone. And people like David Feldman, who still argue that Jews, that there is left anti-Semitism, that the left is the main basis for it. And we draw on a reservoir of images as a nonsense article that he and others co-wrote in political quarter are simply being dishonest. E even the Professor Robert Wistrich, the late professor uh, at Tel Aviv University, who was a, an ardent Zionist, admitted in his book, Socialism and Jews, that the main opponents of anti-Semitism in Germany had always been the social democrats and the communists. It was the left, the working class, which historically opposed uh, anti-Semitism. It wasn't the right, it wasn't the Zionist newfound friends uh, uh, on the American right, it was the left. And therefore those who say that left anti-Semitism is the problem are doing the work of the right. And to be quite honest, the Alliance for Workers' Liberty uh, has scabbed. It, it has supported the witch hunt in essence. 
Uh, I, I don't think there's any socialist future for that organisation because when it came to it with the election of Corbyn, it, it, it worked with the right. Uh, as for swastikas, or, or, I don't advocate uh, daubing swastikas on anyone's gravestone, but uh, anti-Semitism, the key question always is, what is the motive? What is the purpose? What is the reason for someone doing an action? And clearly, if someone is, I mean, we used to give Sikh Heil salutes outside, I can remember the Twickenham rugby ground when the South African Springboks uh, were playing. We didn't do it because we were Nazis. We're doing it as an ironical statement. So clearly someone who daubs a swastika on the, uh, on the gravestone as someone who's killed, murdered 29 Palestinians because they were Palestinians is not being anti-Semitic. Uh, I think I've answered uh, all of those questions, uh, but uh, yeah, thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you so much, comrades. I think that was a really uh, worthwhile discussion and meeting to have. Um, Esther Giles made a really good comment, I think, in the chat that uh, as organizations increasingly still come under pressure to adopt the IRA, that we should, um, perhaps the Labour campaign for free speech can compile a argument sheet or something, A, what's wrong with it, B, here's the Jerusalem Declaration, consider that, or even consider the Oxford Dictionary. There is no need, you know, this is a, the, the Jerusalem de 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 definition is a, a declaration is a counterweight, isn't it? Even if we don't like it that much. Okay, M Moshe wants to come back I, in. I, I want, in this context, I would like to mention a very important document, a letter uh, signed by uh, over 70 Israeli academics working in Britain who uh, have written to universities not to succumb to the diktat of Gavin Williamson. And who, uh, I mean, this, this is a very good document which provides some very useful uh, uh, arguments against the uh, rubbish definition and the reasons why it should be opposed. I think the fact that it is a, a, a large number, of, by the way, also, uh, the, the document, although it was uh, signed initially by over 70 Israeli academics in Britain, it was also then, then endorsed by a large number of Israeli academics in other countries, including in Israel itself, but in various European countries in the United States. I think in this context, it should also be mentioned and used in the academic context. I mean, in the, when, when it comes to this imposition on, on academic institution to adopt this, this uh, 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 toxic uh, definition, then uh, it, it is a very useful document. Thank you, Moshe. Yes, good to know. Um, we will look at that. The Labour Campaign for Free Speech can um, put all these documents, useful documents together. We've published some of them already, um, but that is certainly a, a, useful, a useful contribution. Thank you very much, comrades. This is part of an ongoing of educational uh, yep, sessions you. on all of these issues. Please join the Labour Campaign for Free Speech if you haven't done so yet. We have our first all members meeting on May 29th.